Welcome to. Here we go. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Rock Fantasy Files. I'm Stephen Keeler, also known as the Rock Fantasy Man, and I will be the host and referee for this episode tonight as part of our series of mm-hmm. albums that are celebrating milestone anniversaries. We originally planned to do this in the month of December, but we didn't find a workable date. So we're a little tardy. We're in 2022, but we're going to talk about. We're, chat, we're here to chat about the debut album from Venom, Welcome to Hell. Yeah. It turned 40 in the year 2021. Can you believe it? And I asked some our guests tonight to pick a couple of their favorite tracks, give a brief description of why they like it, or what they don't like about it, and a brief question or two for, we do have a couple of special guests here tonight. Welcome, and we've got Tony. So Tony Demolition Man is here. From Venom Inc. and uh, Venom knows a lot about Venom, of course, and he's got a special guest going to be joining in. Also joining us is Count Ralphus, our local heavy metal historian here in Hudson Valley. We got Tony Dio, we got Ryan Scow, who we stole from the Sea of Tranquility, and we yeah. got Sasquatch Barth from Canadian Thrash Legends Aggression, and we got the mighty Wizard of Black of Death Metal down the bottom. They call him the wizard sometimes. John McAtee from the Mighty Incantation. Yeah, baby. He's gonna a good- <laughs> weave a spell upon you. So, uh, Tony, let's kick it off with you. How you doing, brother? How's it going? Yeah, good. all good, all good. You know, we uh, batting down the hatches over here. The world's gone mad with this COVID shit, and now Omicron and stuff. And uh, you know, but I think we're all getting through it, and we got through the worst of it, and now it's just like you know the political whatever it is, using it to beat us with sticks to, you know, make us all just buy and just get into line and do whatever shit they need us to do to keep us subversed as they always do. But this has been perfect for them. So I think while we had that, this thing going, you know, I think um, it was a bit, you know, a bit more difficult for, for Jeff to take it out for Mantis because, you know, he lives in Portugal, but because um, he had his heart attack and, you know, he was kind of worried about it. But, I think we're over. The, I think we're over the worst of it. We we finished the new album. We got that done during lockdown. We were we were looking at. I was looking at twenty twenty one to put it out, but it's going to be twenty twenty two. But we're rolling up. It's all delivered. It feels great, and we're very excited about it. And we're pushing shows for this year. So fingers crossed, we can actually get back to fucking playing music in front of people, which will be so fucking good after so long. That would be nice to actually see a band. See you guys yeah. for sure here in the I, states for sure. You know what's really mad is is we're here to talk about Welcome to Hell, which is like you know came out of fucking nowhere, was unexpected, changed the shape of so many things, and to think it's now you know forty years anniversary of that, and uh, and we you know myself and man get, getting back to playing like that's kind of mad to think we're still alive and we're still here and we still. Want get out there and kick some fuckers ass you know it's like wow, mind-blowing cool so we're gonna talk to everybody a little bit and go around and uh see what their favorite songs are and uh looks like you've got a special guest here i see in the bottom tony i have he's in my bottom and i'd like to introduce <laughs> the one and only the grand master of hades Mr. Jeff Mantis. So I thought if you're going to do Welcome to Hell, you're going to have the guy who wrote the thing. So Yes. There's <laughs> uh, not much fucking mayhem and madness going on at the minute. I'm fucked. <laughs> How's everybody? You all right? We're hanging in there. Good man. Good man. Good. Mm-hmm. Nice to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks for coming on the channel tonight and talking about this milestone anniversary of Welcome to hell, 40 years. Just a little bit over yeah. now. Right? Mm. Robin. Yeah. Robin. And Robin's here. Thank God. Hey, Robin. Hey, Robin. Welcome, Robin Mays. Hi. You Hi. made it. I made it. I can't see everybody, though. Hi. So, Hello. So I guess, Jeff, what would be a couple of your favorite tracks from the record you'd like to talk about? Or what do you want to talk about, oh, about the record in general? What's your, what's, Jeff, if you had to pick two tracks from Welcome to Hell that, that you would think are your stand-up favorites, which ones would they be? 
Oh, fucking hell. Um, oh. I, for me, Thousand Days of Sodom, because it was my first sort of adventure into trying to write something quite grand. And I think Thousand Days, I've always said this, I think Thousand Days led on to tracks like Seven Gates and Nightmare and stuff like that, you know? Um, and obviously the one that I have, well, I've got vivid memories of all of them. I mean, I can remember walking into Sound Electronics in Newcastle, which was like a, oh, it was it was like a, a disco supply place where they had lights and smoke machines and stuff like that. And we used to go in on a Saturday afternoon and just hang out there. And there was a guy in there called Louis Taylor who later went on to sing in a band called Satan, which you probably heard of from the Northeast. Yeah. And um, he he did some lights and things for us at one of our little shows at some social club in the Northeast. And I remember taking this cassette in, and Louis put it on the um, on the this little PA system that they had, and it was me just playing. I mean, I wasn't plugged into anything. You've got to remember, this was fucking 1980 or something. Mm. And um, it was we my dad's old cassette recorder. <laughs> but you just press, your, my dad's cassette recorder where you just press play and record. And it had an inbuilt mic. And it was, um, what I was playing was the riffs for Angel Dust. So, and the, the other one that's got memories is is Red Light Fever, because it was the first song that I ever wrote, you know? And another track, Witch and Hour, I can remember taking that into rehearsals on a Sunday morning at Newcastle Dockside, or what we call the Quayside. There was a horrible rat-infested um, rehearsal place down there that we used to rehearse in, because it was all we could afford. And um, I remember going in all excited this Sunday morning, and saying, I've got a new song, or a new song, it was Witching Hour. And the thing, the thing that I've sort of realized over the years is all of those songs on Welcome to Hell, barring um, Sons of Satan, which was Conrad's first attempt at writing a song, and I think I'll put the midsection in, um, but all of those songs were my first attempt at writing songs. There was nothing rewritten, there was nothing you know, we didn't have the luxury of what you see behind me now, mm. where, you know, you go, oh, that's a good piece. Of, I wonder if we can just move that green section to that yellow section and see what it sounds like. There was none of that. You know, I would, like I say, I was sitting there with my dad's cassette recorder and my copy flying V and, you know, I wasn't even plugged into an amp. And I was sort of just coming up with these riffs and things. And all of that stemmed from a paperback book that I bought from a family run music store in Newcastle called Windows, which was in a very grand arcade. It's still there to this day. Wow. And um, the book was called Improvising Rock Guitar. And it came with a flexi disc. And on the flexi disc on one side, there was two tracks, one called Snaker and one called Homage to Hendrix. And on the other side was just the backing tracks. So the idea was that you learned the solo via the notation in the book and then played over the backing tracks. Well, I failed miserably at that. But what I did get from it was a movable power chord and the first position of the pentatonic scale. And as soon as I had those two things in my, in my toolbox, I was trying to write my own songs. I wasn't bothered about learning other people's stuff. And that book was written by a guy called Pat Thrall who later went on to record one of the greatest rock albums of the 80s, Hughes and Thrall. Yeah. And at that particular point, I had no idea who the guy was. I just bought I just bought this book with this young guitarist on the front. And basically, that was, that was the only guitar instruction that I ever received. The rest of the thing was just fucking trial and error, you know? But like I say, those all of the songs on Welcome to Hell were just the fledgling attempts of someone trying to write some songs. And I didn't give any second thoughts to them either. And I've said this in interviews before that it's difficult now, 40 years later, or even 20 years later, it's difficult to get back to that naive quality that you had back then 
where you, you didn't overthink the songs. All the songs on Welcome to Hell and indeed on Black Metal are as simple as fuck. You know, there's no fucking grand arrangements. There's no, you know, I don't even, on Welcome to Hell, I don't even think there's a flattened fifth. I didn't know what a fucking flattened fifth was. You know, I had no idea. I mean, come on, pentatonic scale, penta. Penta means five. I didn't even know those five notes. In the It was, you know, that came fucking years down the line. So I think it was, it was an, it, it was a naive quality to the songs. There was a sort of innocence to the songs and the writing, and it was all rock and roll and blues riffs. That's all it was. And I mean, they followed those kind of progressions. If you analyze the songs, um, but I, I think, think it was just the ineptitude of the band that we, we couldn't actually play very well. When we got in the studio, we just fucking murdered those songs and it was recorded and that was it. There was no magic formula. Let's put it that way, none at all. Well, I think it, even that, I even think that that is the essence and that that is, you know, when everybody goes, how did you approach it and what was the formula? I mm. think that magic formula, that there was a naivety, there was a, and innocence in there, and you just didn't care. Yeah, um, yeah. I think, and like, like I say, you know, I think it's, you know, now, you know, myself and Tony have just written the latest Venom Inc. album, you know? So the six songs on there, which are Tony's, and the six songs which are there are mine. And Arve was predominantly me, but I remember on Arve saying to Tony, is this, is this right? You know, because you're so close to it, you need some, you need, some, and I think the thing that helped as well was being out night after night after night, playing those old Venom songs, you know, from 30, well, at that point, 30 odd years ago, you know, um, I mean, you know, some of us remembered them, others didn't, but <laughs> besides, the, that's besides the point, um, the thing is, it's it's like it it let's put it this way. If I come up with the riff to Angel Dust right now and went there to record it, I would listen to it and go, yeah, delete. I'd put it in the bin. I'd put it in the fucking bin. It's the same with Witch Now. I'll be thinking that's just fucking monotonous, that you know, and it, and even something like Countless Bathory. You know, I can remember walking into the studio and Eric Cook's brother, Eric Cook was our manager and Eric's brother, Jed, who had a brief stint with Tony and Adam Graft. But at that point, I think he was with, um, he was with Tyson Dog very briefly at that point. He was on Abaddon's kit and he was going, digga, 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 digga. He had this double bass drum thing going. And I walked in with my guitar and I looked at him and I went, oh, poof, you know, keep going. Plugged in, and I went down, 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 and that was it. Countless bathroom was born. Kronos walked in, he went, "What's that? That sounds cool." And I was like, "Don't know, mate." Down, 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 down. And then he pulled his folder out, and with all these lyrics, he went, "Keep going." And then he went, "Welcome in the Virgin's Fair." That was it. It was born, you know. And even the track "Welcome to Hell" was actually finished in the studio. Because when we, I can vividly remember, um, Neat Records, Impulse Studio, the doorway was right on the high street, but it had this long passage that went up and round. And then you hit a flight of stairs, and then a second little flight of stairs, press the buzzer to get in, then you had another little flight of stairs to go up. As you went up the, those stairs, let's get my bearings, you went up there. On the right was the Neat Records office, right? There was the office door, and then straight ahead of you, I think, was the toilet. And then to the left there was the downstairs studio. Then there was the big flight of stairs that you carried all your gear up. There was no lift. Yeah. We, we were carrying a 412 in, and David Woods, he just says, can I have a word, boys? And we went, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And he went, have you got enough songs for an album? And we went, we looked at each other and was like, yeah, uh-huh. And he went, right, you got three days. And that was it. 
and we didn't have enough songs for an album. We had stuff that we finished off. Welcome to Hell, the title track, was actually finished off in the studio. I had the I had the riff, then the ban up and ban up and ban. And you know, even that, you know, it's sort of a a bit of a backwards blues progression, really. Of course, from an A to an E, where the, the blues would go E, E, A, B, back, you know. But um, you know, I mean, come on, which young band is going to turn around and say no? We haven't got enough songs. You know, we we just grabbed the opportunity. We didn't know what the fuck we were going to do when we got upstairs. And we just went in and we did it. And that was the first time we worked with Keith Nickel. And that was it. You know, it was like, and there was no, let's get a guitar sound. Let's get a drum sound. It was like, let's hear your snare. Crack. Tom one, boom. Tom two, boom. Tom three, boom. They weren't even fucking tuned. You know, have you got any cymbals? Yeah, I've got that one and that one. Right, that'll do. Guitar. And then it was roll, that was it. And I've said all along was, welcome to hell was a moment captured in time. It'll never be repeated. And I think to try and re-record welcome to hell would be the biggest mistake you could fucking make because you could record it better. I've done re-records on here for Facebook playthroughs and I think, fucking hell, that sounds great. It hasn't got what welcome to hell's got though. And that's just the angry attitude of three idiots from Newcastle who couldn't play their instruments very well. And, you know, I've said for all along, the stars aligned and went, boom, right, you're the next thing. It could have been fucking anybody, you know? And then after that, the rest is history. I'll let somebody else talk because I'm sick of hearing your own voice. There you go. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so. Uh, well... Maybe the next person I'm going to hop onto who told me if he could not get on this episode, he wasn't joking. He was never going to step foot in my shop again. So maybe we better get him on quick before something happens. <laughs> so Ralph, Ralph's up here. Ralph, what do you got to say? And what are your favorite tracks? And may a question for Mantis or for Tony or anybody else? Welcome. Just, I, I, I'm so psyched that Mantis joined us tonight. Um, I was only 11 years old when this album came out. I don't hear you. Oh, you don't hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear, I don't hear anybody. You can't hear anybody. All right. So, yeah, I was only 11 years old when this album came out. And, uh, you know, between 12 and 15, I was into like Sabbath and Dio and Ozzy and all that stuff. And uh, like 85, uh, Live After Death came out and Maiden. Before they did their number of the B song, they they did like this big excuse about how they're not Satanist and this and that. And I thought that was so lame at the time. And and then all the bands started from the old guard started kind of going commercial. So I started finding, you know, the Metallicas and all that stuff. And then uh, you know, but by the time I got into Merciful Fate and Venom, there was like no excuses for their image of evil lyrics and everything. So um the the, the first song I want to talk about is In League with Satan. Um, this is my favorite seven inch I probably own with Live Like an Angel. I, I love, uh, it was the first time here in Venom that it like made sense to me. I would see pictures of them in the magazines and they looked so scary and ugly. And I would, I would see the, the albums in the bins and they were just like, you just flip through them real quick because they were so satanic and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I heard Buried Alive and then I heard in league with Satan, they were the two songs that kind of like made sense, and then that was it. Once I got hooked, I, I was all in, and I, I bought, I bought the uh, Here Lies Venom. See that, but it's uh, I, I bought the Here Lies Venom. Set then and then I just you know filed everything from then on, you know, and uh, so along with being the most uh, important extreme metal influence I think of all time for an album, Welcome to Hell, they were also part of. The, one of the most important VHS home video of all time. This classic Ultimate Revenge. Me and my friends watched this more than any music video of all time, and we knew every every interview. We could like recite the words to the interviews as we were watching it, you know. And uh, you know, like Mantis was saying, like they weren't like the greatest musicians, but when you put them all together at that time, that's what that that was the magic formula. It's just you know those three, the long-haired punks, that attitude, you know, 
So yeah, League with Satan is my first, and then Witching Hour was played on the Ultimate Revenge. So that that became a favorite of mine from that. And then, um, so for Welcome to Hell, I wrote uh, When I Die and I Arrive at the Seven Gates of Hell. I hope the house band is Venom, and I'm greeted with the with them playing the song Welcome to Hell. <laughs> then I can feel like hell in a bad, such a bad place to be. Ah, brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> yeah. As far as my ranking, I'm going to give it my highest ranking I've ever given on the Rock Fantasy Files. I'm going to give it a 666. Wow. Instead of a 10. Yeah. It, is such, it is such an important record. It, 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 it really kick started the whole extreme metal movement. And I, I'm so happy to be joining you today and celebrate this fucking groundbreaking album. Okay. Oh, cool. and I, also, I also recently just got this. I don't know if you can see that, but I, I just got this on Saturday. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good thing we invited well, you to the party. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing. Beautiful thing. Ralph, do you have a question or anything for Tony or for Mantis? Well, I wasn't sure Mantis was going to be on here, so I didn't have, really have any questions okay. for Mantis. No worries. For Tony, I, I, I was going to bring up this album from 1985 that I had. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. I know, okay. I know that, I know Atomicraft, uh, opened up for Venom and, and Exodus on the 85 tour, and they did some other big tours with Nuclear Assault and uh, Nasty mm. Savage. But I'd just like to hear Tony talk a little bit about that time, because I don't hear much about about that. So if Tony would like to... You know, that was, that was by the time we, by the time we got to get to a record deal, it was with Meek Records. Of course, that was the home of Venom. And as Jeff said about Jed, he was drumming in Tyson Dog and then he came in with me. So I think it was kind of a natural home, you know, because Neat Records had Raven, which was a three piece, Venom, which was a three piece. And they both were, you know, uh, uh, like they were, they were my sounds as well. I loved Raven just from the very beginning. And, and the first time I was aware of uh, Venom, I actually, uh, Jeff's girlfriend lived in my street across the road. So I would see him all the time. And her younger brother had a guitar and he would come across and jam. And he would talk and say, oh yeah, because you know, and he has a uh, boyfriend, yeah, because he's in a band too. And I go, yeah, everybody's in a band. And then I'd see him with his flares and his cowboy boots and his long blonde hair, you know, walking by. And then my, my girlfriend, had a had a, another friend and she said to me one Sunday, Oh, I've started seeing this guy and he's in a band and they just did some photos. And she pulled out some photocopies of these uh, black and white pictures. And it was Venom on the beach at Whitley Bay or Tynemouth for the they were doing the photo session, which ended up on the back of Welton the Hell. And I said, Oh, I know that blonde guy. He's going out with a girl who lives across the road from me. And uh, and I recognized Conrad because in the in the late seventies I went to Neat Records with my punk band to do a demo, and the guy who showed us round they said, "Oh, we'll get uh, we'll get Conrad down to show you round." And and I met Conrad, and he was only a little, little skinny guy working in the studio, and he was really sweet and really. I thought, wow, he's like a really pretty little, little young girl. He's very nice and very polite. <laughs> yeah, that didn't last too long. But um, but yeah, so I kind of was aware of them and I saw Tony around the pubs all the time. And then I there was rumblings these guys were making a record and that blew my fucking mind. I was like, oh my God, they're making a record? How, how can you make a record? There's only all the big bands make records. We don't kind of make records. And then I remember her her uh, brother, Jeff's girlfriend's brother, knocking on my door. My mom said, oh, Malcolm's there. I opened the door and he was holding the fucking seven inch in League with Satan. And he went, this is their record. They made the record. And I turned it over. There was a picture from the beach that I'd seen on these photo stats. And I was like, oh shit, he fucking have made a record. And yeah, I put it on just like you described it. And so many people have described it to me, like Paul Speckman and all these people, you know. I had the, uh, Jeff Becerra, I had the same reaction. I just put it on and the, there was some gravity in that that I'd never heard before. And I just, from the opening 
minute to the closing of Live Like an Angel, I just fell in love with it, the sound. I thought it was amazing. And, uh, and yeah, I was hooked ever since. And uh, we recorded in 1985 and the first tour we went out with, to, to tour, we played with Slayer um, in London. And then we went straight out with Venom and Exodus. And Exodus had only just put out uh, Bonded by Blood. So they flew over, we, we toured Europe with them. And, you know, Gary's still a friend to this day, Rick Honnold, Paul Balaf was so dear to me. I, I We had so much fun. Um, and I remember in Copenhagen, you know, when I think about it now, it blows my fucking mind. We were in Copenhagen, the bus, the tour buses were parked in the red light district. So there was like heroin addicts all over the street, like prostitutes everywhere. And we were only young guys and I was like, Fucking hell, I didn't know this this world existed. And uh, there was the uh, Metallica were recording, I think one of the albums, Master of Puppets or Ride the Light, I can't remember which one, but they were in Copenhagen. So they came down to the show. And then I remember there was a knock on the bus because I'd been complaining that I was really hungry and there was no food. And when I went and opened the door to the bus, it was Paul Baloff and King Diamond had the trays from their backstage with all the sandwiches on that we brought you food. When I think about all these people now who were all just one community, uh, it's, it's incredible, you know. Uh, but that was the, a, a magical time. You know, I got to be with my friends with Venom uh, and, and Exodus who became my friends and watch these people go on to do great, great things uh, while I became a bus driver and so a Mustang. But you know, it was amazing time and, and uh, so, so special. But to actually get the opportunity in 1988 to then be in a band with my friends, because me and Jeff had done some stuff on his Mantis things and, and we've been great friends for so long, but to actually be together playing, and that's a unity that's that's kind of never been broken. And And I've always said, you know, I think, what was really special about Venom, of course, all three of them, and of course, what they did and the impact of that music, which just uh, blew, blew a big hole in the corporate music system that was controlled with big bands, arena bands, and, and uh, you know, even the selling of, you know, Saxon and Iron Maiden. And, and you know, if, if you look at Iron Maiden, it went from, you know, the first two albums to Number of the Beast was hitting the charts with Run to the Hills and everybody was trying to get on MTV. So they were all doing these, your know, polished videos and, and you had your Motley Cruise and your Quiet Rock and they were looking for commercial radio. And then all of a sudden you had Venom and just when it went, fuck it, we don't know, we don't care. We're just doing it like this. And three days later, you got a piece of gold that just drops like a brick in a bucket of donkey shit and sprays everybody. And they go, I don't know what the fuck happened there, but I want to do that too. And that's why I think they're so special. That album is so special, you know. If I, if, when I put Sons of Satan on, from the minute that album opens, there's no, there's no fancy beginning, there's no orchestrated opening. It just goes boom. It fucking punches you right through to the throat, yeah. and from that moment, you're just enraptured by the whole thing. Uh, to the very end of Red Light Fever, it just takes you through it, kicks the shit out of you, and and leaves it there. And when you pick it up, it's it's grotesque, it's it's dangerous, it's evil, it's everything about it, you know, from the images to the to the actual product. And I think that's it. It's that beauty and that naivety of it uh, that captured that moment. Like like Jeff just said, it's a moment in time for all of us, uh, but particularly for them. And because of that, it's wonderful. It's like a snapshot, like a time capsule of, of a particular moment where you have magic. Wonderful. I don't know what more we can say after that description of it, <laughs> but uh, I, we're going to have to try. So uh, let's there's move picture, over. There's, let's, there's let's, a picture oh, of Tony yeah. with his long hair. If anybody oh, wants to shit. know what he looks like with hair. Oh. Those are the kids. Those are the, the one in the middle. Yeah. yeah. The one with the wig on. I'm the one in the with the wig on in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, let's uh, hop over to Ryan Scow. He's back on the channel. I stole him from the Sea of Tranquility. Up Good. To Squares, who's he's a famous <laughs> talker every week on there. So, uh, welcome and tell us your briefly about Man. what you dig. This is uh, so I'm, I'm only uh, I'm 39, so I'm like I'm like a little baby here, man. But uh, <laughs> man, I just it's a fucking honor. Holy shit! Like uh, uh, 
Jeff, I don't, a couple weeks ago, uh, you recorded a little Christmas thing. Uh, it was like, uh, I think from uh, Johnny Z, like to uh, myself, Nick, Craig, Karen, and Randy, uh, Johnny's niece. Uh, I'm that Ryan, man. So it's cool, you know, <laughs> friends of both sides. That's fucking, uh, I appreciate it. That was a cool Christmas gift. I fucking appreciated that, man. I my, Randy sent that over. I'm like, what's this? I open up like, ah, shit, it's fucking Mantis. You know, <laughs> and, uh, that was fucking cool, man. But, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, this, you're very welcome. Thank, I appreciate it, man. This, yeah, this, I, I can't even count how many times I've listened to this fucking album. If I had to pick three songs, uh, because it's an album you put on, you listen to the whole thing all the way through. There's, yeah. there's no, uh, there's no pausing, but, uh, man, uh, yeah, like, like Tony said, put it on, Sons of Satan comes out, it's like a fucking artillery barrage, it's explosive. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Witching Hour, obviously in league with Satan and uh, Schizoid, man. Schizoid's uh, that's yeah. such a good fucking song. <laughs> I love that. So but it's it's tough to narrow it down to three because I love this is definitely my favorite Venom album. Uh, it's got that it's just got that magic to it, man. Like you guys said, you know, there's something about it you can't replicate. You know, it's just it was a moment in time. It's perfect. You know, ten out of ten, six hundred sixty six out of ten, perfect album, man. Fucking cheers, guys. I'm happy to be here. It's cool. Uh, Ryan, uh, so you. you gave it the highest rating it can get, like Count Robinson. We got we got 666 twice now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that fucking good. It's a fucking awesome album. I listen to it all the time. Like, you know, I mean, I bought it when I was 18, which was, yep. you know, so right 2000 or so. But I still listen to it all. every Like, every week I put this album on a couple times a week. It's just Any that fucking good. Any question? You know Any question for them about it before we move on? Next person? No, nah, not really. I'm just, uh, I just fucking love it. Fucking cheers, man. Cheers, guys. I'm just ha happy cool. as a pig and shit to be here. But you know, right, right as well. I just wanted to say that you know, one of the things, I, one of the things I really wanted us to do uh, with Abaddon, and of course with Mantis, there was to play every song from it, to mm. play every. And and uh, because you know, obviously, you're going to play well to hell classic, and you're going to play witching hour, great closer, um, um, uh, you know, so so much. Of it. But red light fever, I don't know, sons of Satan. You could play poison and skit. So, but there's a lot. Live like an angel. But mm -hmm. I, it was magic and all of it. And and I'm happy to say that we played every single song off that album, and. Every time we play A Thousand Days in Sodom, which is one of my absolute favorites, and it is the precursor to Seven Gates and Nightmare, like Jeff said, uh, it, it's DOS, it's grand, it's the, it's the forebearer to what he was going to write later. They're magic to play live. I mean, oh. I played lots of songs in my life. They're magic when we play them live. And what we did one tour where we were playing Red Light Fever. We did it nowhere at Inferno Fest. And it was like... I don't know. It was like being in fucking hell. The minute we started it, I just lost my, I lost myself in the song. <laughs> it was just rapturous. And, you know, Poison became a real great song. Sons of Satan became an anthem. We were playing that like as one of our encores and people just lost their shit as soon as we went into it. Oh. Every, there was, I'm, 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 I know we're going to pass on to someone else, but I just got to say this, that. Okay. If you think of classic albums, um, if you think of everybody's classic albums, there'll be one or two tracks. You may say there's no fillers, and you might like the albums, but there's one or two standout tracks which where people will always go to. What I always found with Venom, including the singles, is every single song was it's a standalone song. Every single song. I mean, that's incredibly unusual, you know? And we would play every B-side of every single, and at every A side of every single, and everybody would ask us to play the B sides too. So we started doing Dead of the Night and 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 uh, you know all 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 that. Well, and the more we play, the more fans ask us to play. So it's like this this ball that never stops rolling, you know. Mm -hmm. I saw you guys. Uh, you played Saint Vitus in Brooklyn with Onslaught a couple of years yes. ago. It was Empire of Evil? That was we fucking did. great. And I remember you played back-to-back -back nights in St. Vitus to Venom Mink. That, both of those nights were fucking great. And I saw you at a place called, uh, it wasn't Gramercy, it was uh, Webster Hall in uh, Manhattan. Yeah. And that was fun. All those shows, were, you guys were so fucking good. Every show was just like, like mind-blowing. I remember you played Warhead, slower and heavier. Yeah. Ah, it was fucking heavy. That was shit. good shit. And you know, 
Boom. You know, the funny thing when we did Webster Hall, uh, when we did that show, they came, they came to me before the show and they said, Tony, uh, there's a hard curfew. So if you and I said, excuse me, he said, there's a hard curfew. So if you and I went, hang on, what's a hard curfew? Is that like a curfew, but different? And he said, well, it's a hard curfew. So 10.30, that's it. You know, we pull the plugs, everything goes off. I was like, okay. So they said, is that okay? You finish at 10.30? I went, no, we just finish when we finish. And he <laughs> went, but you have to finish for 10.30. And I went, okay. So we went on, we came, we came off about five past 11 <laughs> and the P was still going. <laughs> and I, the guy came to me at like 10.35 I said, Tony, you know, it's 10.35. I said, yeah, he went, remember the hard curfew? I went, do you want to tell the audience or shall I? I said, let's just, let's just close it. And we did. Amazing. <laughs> you know, we did the same thing in Turkey. We played in Turkey. We invited to play in Turkey. <laughs> <and Okay. laughs> we, we, yeah, we wouldn't stop. And they kept going, you've got to stop because the cops have come. And we were like, fuck it, well, let's play a few more. And we just kept playing. The place was rammed. The cops eventually came in and all lined up at the back. We still kept going. They turned off the whole PA so we couldn't do anything. So I got everybody to do a cappella in league with Satan with us while the drums <laughs> kept playing. It was fucking mental. And the cops were like, what the fuck's wrong with these yeah. guys? Man? Uh, you know. Well, so, anyhow. Yeah. Well, let's uh, make a little game plan here. Uh, I got Tony Dio yet to go. We got Boss, we got John, we got uh, Sasquatch and Robin. So uh, let's let's uh, okay. throw it over to Tony Dio real quick, and then we'll go to Sasquatch, and then we'll go to McEntee, and we'll round it out with Amazing Mason. How's that, guys? Tony. The hey guys. Tony. The other Tony. The, Tony. the other Tony. Hey. What's up, guys? How, How is it? There you guys. Go. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, I got into Venom, um, I guess it was around uh, 86 or so is when I first really discovered you guys. And it was with this cassette, it's called Metal Killers Collection, one of those castle, uh, oh, shit. Kind of castle collection, it had black metal on it. I was like, this is awesome. And I, it's so many bands I discovered, new wave of British metal bands that were on here. It was really cool. Um, from there, I went and I found From Hell to the Unknown. So I got a good collection of the stuff from like the first three albums on here. And that just you know, just define me as more of a fan. I, I, I had, I had to get more. I started looking for magazines. I, I was buying old praying magazines and finding pictures of you guys. And just, you, it was so larger than life, you know? And then, um, I picked up, um, I think I picked up welcome to hell, which I don't have the welcome to hell set anymore, but I have a black metal one, but I always thought it was funny that the spine reads Denon. And it did on the Welcome to Hell and on the black metal cassettes that I've had. That's D E N O N. I don't know how neat <laughs> how that got past the proofreaders at Neat Records, but it did. I always thought it was, you know, okay, it was crazy proof, to put it on one, but it's on two. Proofreader. <laughs> no, I don't so, think there was. Um, a, do you know what it is? Just before you go on, Tony, there was definitely no proofreaders. There was nobody who looked at the artwork because if anybody with an ounce of fucking common sense would have went, you're not putting that shit out. Right? <laughs> and nobody ever listened to the fucking songs. Dave Wood could not tell you one fucking Venom song from another. Honestly, yeah. it was a case of we would deliver the fucking master quarter inch tape. He would go, thanks, boys. Send it off to the fucking press and plant. And that was it. He never listened to the shit. So yeah. proofreaders. Fucking no chance. <laughs> <laughs> they probably they probably used the same template when they did the layout. Yeah. You didn't even change. Probably, it. yeah, 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 but, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I got the uh, I ended up getting the ultimate revenge uh, on VHS, and when I saw the Witch and Hour video, that <laughs> totally solidified me. I'm mega Venom fan now. This is the most large in life because I'm a huge Kiss fan, and to see the stage show, you guys had the crazy. Horror cans, lighting, and smoke. It was just so over the top seeing that that witch in our video. Um, I remember going to the uh, video rental store and they had a copy of Live '85 on VHS, and I freaked out. I was like, I got I got to rent this. And I remember going to the counter and the guy said, "You want to buy this? Nobody ever rents this. Would you like to buy it? I can sell it to you. I'll get the price for you." It's like, yeah, whatever. I wanted to buy it, you know. So, so I ended up getting that. So. Just seeing, and that was the first time I saw a whole Venom live show, and it was incredible, you know. So, um, Welcome to Hell, uh, great album. Uh, it's probably my favorite Venom studio album of all of them. 
Uh, my favorite songs from it would be Witching Hour because that video is just so over the top. Just made me such a fan of that song. Uh, a Thousand Days in Sodom. I love that song. I love the breakdown when you, you know, Kronos does a bass solo and then it switches over and Manus does his guitar solo. It's kind of, that was so neat to me. You know, you only saw something like, I think Motorhead did that with, uh, yeah. uh, with um, Stay Clean, you know, the trade off <laughs> of the solo. You hear a bass solo, it's really cool, you know. And um, I guess um, I would say Live Like an Angel, Die Like a Devil. That's probably my third favorite because I love okay. that song. It's just so great. First time I ever heard it and all. And I was trying to play bass back then. And, you know, just Kronos' womb, his runs, you know, that just blew me away. I could do that. You know, <laughs> I couldn't play anything else. But I could do the Kronos woos, you know. So it's, it, was, it was always so cool, man. And uh, so I, I'll definitely give it a 666 as well. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know, yeah, baby. You know, and I wanted to tell you guys, man, you know, I met you guys several times on that last U.S. tour that you guys did. And, uh, you know, I met a lot of a lot of rock stars and stuff through the years. I got to hang out with people. But it was, I will cherish those times I hung out with you guys because you – you invited me and my girlfriend and uh, a couple of you remember Michelle and Neil Waterman. From oh, yeah. We all hung out with you guys on the bus. And yes, I was asking, asking you asking you questions about the about the uh, the um, witch in our video and so forth. And you guys were giving me all the, you know, the details about the filming and stuff. And I know we even talked about uh, Manus's deceiver video that you were in, Tony. You know, yes. you know, uh, yes. you know we've done a little yes. behind the scenes info about those videos from the hair band era and yeah. Uh, yeah so so yeah man i really cherished that man it was so so cool to hang out with you guys man because venom was so large in their life i mean i put you guys up there with kiss man it's like you just just untouchable back in the day man and just to get to hang out and talk to you guys was so cool man it really was cool. you know really. that's brilliant and manis i love seeing your cat pictures man they're beautiful <laughs> yeah, I've got, got some, you got some beautiful kitties, man. I'm a cat guy too. So. Tony, yeah. you, yeah, can you, like, you can say you like you can say you like seeing his pussy. It's okay. I, yeah, I do. I enjoy his pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks, thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, That's great thanks for joining us, Tony. And uh, I guess we're gonna. Uh, what? What? You gave it the rating, right? Never mind. All right, so we're good. Uh, yeah. We're going to move over to the Great White North up there in Canada with our favorite Bigfoot monster, Sasquatch Barth, that's here. <laughs> hey, guys. Nice to, nice to hey, see you. Good to um, see you. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I bought Welcome to Hell the day it came out uh, up in, Mon in Montreal, Canada. Um, we used to have a record store there called Rock on Stock. Uh, which was owned by uh, Michel Mies, who also owned Banzai Records, uh, who was yep. famous for doing multiple bootleg Venom album, um, many like Canadian Assault and so many. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm not sure if the the money never got to Jeff. I'm pretty sure it never made it. Uh, <laughs> the, no, the, the, check, the check's still in the post. Yeah. <laughs> it's still in the post. But the copy okay. I purchased, the, the copy I purchased was actually a neat records. And uh, and I mentioned that before, like uh, everything about the cover was telling me to purchase this album. Uh, I like the pictures in the back. I like the song title. I like that it was about Satan. To me, it was like, you know, if Kiss, if Kiss started the job with me, like Venom finished it. I told you guys before it changed my life. And Jeff already apologized twice. Uh, <laughs> Every, everything after that uh, was not heavy enough or crazy enough. And, you know, um, I listened to this album 40 years later uh, quite frequently. Um, the, the funny thing about uh, this, uh, this record and like my love of it is trying to find musician, first of all, who would like to play Venom with you was very difficult in 1981. And to try to like uh, even being able to have anybody who wants to like even hang out with you while you're listening to Venom was difficult. <laughs> My friends were into Rush and like uh, into Maiden kind of like slowly start to drift away from me. Uh, and they were, I think they were just fucking scared of the entire experience. Uh, but 
you know what? Eventually, I did find people who were want to play Venom with me. And when Aggression formed, actually, the first song we ever played as a band was Welcome to Hell. And we like we were right. jamming it. And then we, we played most songs from the first two uh, Venom records. Um, and, you know, to this day, it's uh, memories we all share. Like Jeff said, it, and all you guys, it's a moment in time and it'll never be able to be reproduced. Um, my favorite songs, um, I really like the song Poison because it was very educational. Uh, you know, when we were younger, like, well, maybe some of us now, but we used to have like lots of sexual partners and this song, you know, would really <laughs> tell you about what to do and what not to do. Um, <laughs> so it was not as ambiguous as Cat Scratch Fever or some of the songs like that. The lyrics were more like, like I said, educational, and I really enjoyed like the song itself. Um, I've never heard a Venom song being called educational before. <laughs> it was. It was, it was, it was, it was. In, in forty fucking years, that's a first, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> Here you go, bud. Here you go. Um, second favorite song was "Red Like Fever." Um, I just love the started riff. Dun, 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 yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Right. So. Um, and uh, just like the, the the overall delivery of the song is extremely like uh, aggressive and fucking in your face, like it's <laughs> right. Uh, so this one, I you know, in in, our, in my circle of friends, we even thought of "Welcome to Hell" and "In League with Satan" as the commercial songs, right? So we would not even like go to these songs too much. We wanted to see like the more like evil and and weirder songs. And my favorite, uh, and it's still one of my favorite metal song of all time, it's 1,000 Days in Sodom. Um, and it's because of that, well, that progression. When he goes like, uh, no one knew the suffering, and he goes into the second fret. Um, it just like, it's so good. It's so good. Um, we were French Canadian, so we were not really good speaking English. Still not that great, but learning. But... <laughs> We, so I had to sing those songs trying to figure, we had no lyrics, we had nothing. We just like go in the, but to try to understand that he starts, starts the song with the word unholy, with the way that it's delivered, it sounds like, like nothing but the word, right? So when years later I had access to the lyrics and I knew what we were trying to like, <laughs> trying to sing, it didn't sound at all with what the lyrics were actually were. So we were kind of mimicking the words. Um, but yeah, yeah. Welcome to Hell. Uh, Forty years later, still one of my favorite records, and you know it changed my life. Uh, and I've been like, I've probably been spending a ten thousand days in Sodom since. Um, so, but I fucking love everything about it. So, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Tony, to carrying the torch and still playing that music because I fucking love it. So, oh, Where and I have a question. I do have a question for Jeff. I have a question, and you talk about Welcome to Hell being the last song you guys recorded in the studio. So uh, in the, when we used to play the song, there's like a long freaking like snare roll in the middle of the song, like <laughs> But you can still see, hear the beat going on in the back. Like was there the snare like overdub or is he really hitting like the right at the same time? Like, fuck off. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> yeah. I'll fire. <laughs> you know, it, it, the band was called Venom, not Rush. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fucking no chance. Nah, fucking anything like that was fucking overdubbed. I found in a fucking sample library. The BBC sample library of fucking snare rolls. That's what <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> yeah, man. But anyway. well, I mean, even, even the, the, the track itself, I mean, you know, we got this idea of having uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall live all that fucking bollocks and all on, you know. And it was like, right, who's going to do that? So we just ran downstairs and we grabbed Susan, who was the receptionist, and just dragged her upstairs and went, read that. And that's, that's what happened, you know? I mean, <laughs> everything about that album is fucking DIY. And it's the same with, with Buried Alive, you know? the, the like I say, um, I, I, I've seen this documentary about uh, Priest when they did Metal Gods and they had a tray, a tin tray full of cutlery for the, you know, they're, they're doing this and they had a pool cue to do the in the air. 
Well, when we did Buried Alive, we had the microphone at the top of the stairs outside of the studio, stone stairs, so it was quite reverberant anyway. So we had a microphone underneath a cardboard box and we just brought some soil and earth in and just literally went like that on top of the cardboard box. So it was out of a bucket on top. And that's the effect of Buried Alive, you know? Wow. Conrad says the sort of, we are brought forth into this world with nothing and with nothing we depart. And his, his voice was just slowed down. Um, but the same for Welcome to Hell, anything. And I mean, the, the track Mayhem with Mercy, I had that little thing that I'd been messing about with for ages. And uh, it was just like, oh, well, we'll record that, that as well. Why not? It'll make up some time. You know, so, so there was no great plan. And at the beginning, is it the beginning of Red Light Fever? You get the little... Orchestra, yeah. Right, here's the tale. That whole album was recorded over somebody else's album. It wasn't even new tape, right? It wasn't even a new 24 track tape. It was secondhand fucking tape. So when we got to that break, there was this little thing that went, diddly, diddly, diddly. we're sitting there, what the fucking hell is that? We're looking around. And then when we did the, um, the intro to Red Light Fever, that's when Conrad goes, oh, the mattress, you want to come to bed? Oh. And that, then it kicks in, you know? But we just left it in. It was like, <laughs> but like I said, the whole Amazing. thing was, I mean, even, you know, you speak about the, the, the Witch Hour, um, Witch Hour Bloodlust video. I mean, that was fucking, so fucking DIY as well. Right, give me two seconds, two seconds. Right, if I can find it, right? <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can find it for you. Right, like I say, completely fucking DIY that. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to oh, find it in here or not. I don't know. Um, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, there's so much stuff in here. Is that it? Yes. Right. Here's an exclusive for you. Which in our bloodlust? The video which was shot at the People's Theatre and a theatre in Jesmond area of Newcastle. Right. This here is a form that I used to have to fill in at my uncle's gas station, okay? Because my first job was pumping gas. That's what I used to do. As soon as I left school, I left school on the Friday and I started, started work for my uncle on the Saturday morning, right? I had a very troubled last year at fucking school. I was fucking, oh, hey, fuck, psych unit, fucking, you're, you're mad, all that kind of stuff, right? So I start, I left school straight out of there. I used to have to fill these forms in for people who had credit at the gas station. So one day when I was at the gas station, and this is from, this will be the late fucking 70s, early 80s. This is the original piece. That's what I did. And that is the actual stage design for the Witching Hour and bloodlust video that I drew wow. at my uncle's gas that station is. way, way back. That is the original. It is paper thin now. Well, it wow. is paper, but it's very thin. On the back, you can see it says credit sheet. And then you had to put the attendance name in, which was my name, would go in there. And then I would have to fill in all the credit sales down here for the day. So this particular day, we were going to do the video. And that's what I did. Wow. And that's if you look at that and then look at the Witch and Hour Bloodlust video, it is identical to that. So I designed that video stage. There's the 412s, there's the drum riser, Conrad stack, and then all the lights either side, drum kit in here, the lights at the bottom, and then the direction of the lights that we wanted. I did all that as well. And that's the original thing. So, like I say, DIY. That even transpired into the Hammersmith Audience Show in 1984, where we made everything. The ramps were the 666 either side. I was painting those in a friend's garden when the truck pulled up to take them down to London. The paint dried in the truck on the way to London. <laughs> yep. 
So that, that's how that's how DIY and absolutely just what can we do? That that was the whole thing with us. It was like, what can we? We've got no money, but what can we do? And that that's that was Venom. That was the way it was done. Same with the albums. Mm. Everything. Same thing. Wow. So there you go. There's a bit of history for you, anyway. Some interesting, history. interesting story awesome. there for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were right. yeah. So let's let's move over uh, to Mr. McAtee. We've been making him wait a while. Let's, uh, yeah. Just cool. before we go, just oh. before we go, just before we go, has anybody got that big 40th anniversary box set thing? You yeah. Know? And it's got the, it's got the church hall recordings mm -hmm. in. Yeah. You have it, Tony. That's the original yeah, I've got cassette it. tape. Yeah. Cool. This I remember you showed the original that. cassette tape. Yeah. Wow. That's the nice. that is the Westgate Road cassette tape, which was recorded on my father's cassette recorder. That is the original. <laughs> yep. That's a hot. The original big, does big not hearts. come from Kronos. It does not come from BMG. That is it. <laughs> there. It's not even Still high quality tape. tape. There you <laughs> go. Next. <laughs> Carry on, chat. I guess you're next, John. Hi, what's up, brother? Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, same old, same old. I mean, Welcome to Hell was a super huge album for it. I remember seeing it at my local uh, flea market. There's this guy there. He'd be like, yo, check this out. Just gonna, you know, from New Jersey. And I said, I have the accent. Yo, goes, yo, check this out. You know, I think you'll like this stuff. And then he, get, he showed me this. What was it? The picture disc of Welcome to Hell. No, I and I was just, oh, yeah. I, I just seen that and I was just like, holy fuck, these guys are really fucking crazy. Like, I thought I was like, you know, into heavy stuff, but I seen that picture. I mean, the front was just so blatant and the back, the way it just looked, it just looked perfect for anybody that like wants to buy something that they know is like way over the edge of, you know, what I was into before that. It was probably, I mean, it was, you know, I'm, a, I guess, a late bloomer for Venom. I mean, I got into him in, what, 84, probably, 83, 84 -ish. I can't, can't remember that time. But, you know, it was like, I, I just, I knew the band a little bit. You know, I seen people with the jackets on, and I just always thought, like, wow, those guys are fucked, you know, or whatever. But at a certain <laughs> point when I, like, finally was like, okay, I could accept this. Like, I, you know, I get what's going on here. Now, yeah, once hearing that... It, you know, just hearing the way the album kicks in and, you know, it was just mind blowing. It, it was one of those ones that at first I didn't a hundred percent understand it, but I knew I thought it was just so cool. You know, it was just so like everything just it was evil. Like every bit of that album, every note on that album, was just evil and piss and vinegar, you know, and I just, you know, and it, but what was great is obviously the songs are so catchy and they're evil, which is just really a great thing for, you know, especially, you know, at that young age, I wasn't like capable of understanding something too technical anyway. So it was like, it was perfect for me. Um, <laughs> <You can help. laughs> Music for retard slaves. Yeah, right? exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's a you know an amazing album. I, mean, I don't really have a favorite song on it because it's one of those albums, you know, that you just listen to from beginning to end, and it's just it's a just an awesome journey. Um, but it, if I you know to make this quick, just um, my, my question I was gonna ask was, you know, was Venom being what it was that early on, or what it still is, I guess. Um, was it by design? Like, were you guys like, we're going to make the heaviest, scummiest, evilest, darkest thing ever? Or was it just like, that's just what you were and just happened to come out on the recording like that? I would have to say the latter. I would have to say that the, I don't think there was any, I don't think there was any master plan, to be perfectly honest. Yes, we, we had this desire to be the loudest, the fastest, the heaviest, the fucking whatever, 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 blah, blah, blah. We've heard it all before. But every band is, is going to say that, right? So, um, I, like I say, I think it was, it was naivety and it was just, you know, those songs that I wrote when we got in the studio and kicked in as a band, we just did something to them. If another band had played those songs, I don't think they would have sound the same. 
because you know every band i'll i'll hold my hands up right now and say every band at neat records was far superior musicians to us far superior and it used to fucking piss them off something rotten <laughs> that we were the ones who were going away and playing these shows but the thing was i think you know again when it came around the new wave of british heavy metal we never felt a part of that because within that new wave of british heavy metal there was still that similarity and familiarity whereas we were i think we were right on the fucking outside right on the edge whether we intended to be or not i don't know um you know it's I'd, yes i will say yes we had that desire and you know there was there was that thing but i've also read you know Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons say that that they created the band they wanted to see on stage and i do believe that we said that at some point in an interview mm. um but it still blows my mind to think that basically as a you know late teens early 20s i wrote some songs in my bedroom i was still living with my parents and then you know we've been on stage in beijing and hear a chinese audience sing fucking countess pathory i wrote that song <laughs> in my fucking bedroom it was, it's <laughs> like you know that that's and you know having this conversation how many bands can say that they have this you know that yeah. this somebody is going to talk about their first album 40 years later their first album changed the face of he fucking heavy metal changed the music industry there's not a lot of bands have got that accolade or that honor and i still now even being here talking to you guys i'm still sitting there and sometimes i'll just sit there going because it just you know yeah. Like I say, I've always said I was a kid from Newcastle. I wrote some songs, and I was very lucky that people dig them. Cool. There you go. Well, an it. Another quick question too is just um, with the when the album was done and you like mixed it, did you know it was good, or did you listen back to it and be like, "We don't know what the hell we did"? It was because you were so young cool. and so novice. You know, like did you no, know it was we, heavy as fuck? No, nobody, do you know what it is? None of us had any fucking studio experience, right? You know, I met Conrad at um, my girlfriend's friend's house. I walked in this night and she introduced me to this guy who was sitting on the sofa and he was like, oh, I'm Conrad. So I just thought, he was a metalhead, I was a metalhead. Well, there was a load of metalheads in the house. We were just sitting around listening to metal. And... Um, I says, oh, you know, come around to fucking what bands we like and all that thing. I says, oh, I've got a band, you know, we're looking for another uh, rhythm guitarist. And he was like, well, I play guitar. And um, I was like, all oh, right. And then the thing that clinched it for me, when I think about it logically, was he says, oh, I'm working at that, um, Impulse Studios. And I was like, oh, now, the guy <laughs> that I actually started the band with, Dave Rutherford, me and Dave had been to Impulse Studios. We walked in and asked about demos and it was too expensive. We walked away with our tail between our legs. We just couldn't afford to do it, you know? So I was like, oh, oh, very nice, you know? So I invited them along to a fucking rehearsal anyway. And uh, true story, Abaddon's first words were, oh, who's she? She's nice. Anyway, years later, we're in the studio, right? At the end of Welcome to Hell, right? Like I say, None of us had fucking studio experience. There's a great article by Steve Thompson, isn't it, Tony, who wrote yeah. about the fucking the Conrad years and it, it <laughs> impulse. If you can find it, read it. It dispels all the myth, right? I'm telling you. And this is coming from the guy who worked there, and it's true, right? Um, so none of us knew what a fucking EQ, a fucking reverb, a fader, or anything like that was, right? It was bollocks. And to answer your question. We didn't know what for, what how to get a heavy sound or anything like that. If you would stuck me in the studio at that point in time and said, "Right, mix that album," I would have went, <laughs> "Right, where's the, sho where's the shovel? What do I do?" I have, no, I have no fucking idea, you know. So it 
you know what it is? Keith Nickel, who engineered that album and actually produced that album, mixed that album. Keith Nickel, years later when I was doing Winds of Change, we were just sitting, having lunch, and we were chatting. And he said that after Welcome to Hell, he used to get young bands coming in to do these neat records, 50, 50 pound demos. We used to call them the 50 quid demos, right? So then the band came in, gave their votes 50 pounds, and then they had so many hours in the studio to crank out as many songs as possible. And that was their demo tape, okay? They went away with a cassette. So Keith used to say to me, well, he's, he's, Keith said to me that he got a lot of these young bands coming in. So Keith would say, okay, then, what do you want to do? Who, what, what's your sound? Uh, he says, a lot of these young bands would go, make us sound like Venom. And Keith said, I all, always had to turn around and say, I can't. I don't know what those guys do, but they come into the studio, they set up, they're not even in tune, they plug in and it happens. Like I say, there was no sort of, you know, oh, let's get a guitar sound and let's tweak the tone and all like that. No, honestly, it was Spinal Tap. Thrip, everything up to 10, feeding back like fuck. I had a horrible blue fuzz pedal. I engaged that and off we went. You know, it, <laughs> it, that's, that's how, how naive it was, you know? And like I've said, I think that and the inability to play contributed to the sound and i'm just being honest i mean if the other two want to go oh yes well i sat there and i eq this and I, yeah well whatever you fucking did yeah uh -huh. <laughs> bollocks a lot of shit we and went in there we made a lot of noise and that was it i i'd just like to say from from exactly what jeff just said to underline that point that even when we were recording atom craft demos after Welcome to Hell, I'd said to Keith the very exact what Jeff just said. I said, it doesn't sound right. And Keith went, well, that's that's how you're playing. I went, yeah, but can't you give us the vibe that Venom's got? Like on that, the Venom, the, that atmosphere they've got. And then he went, I can't give you that. I said, why? Is it some sort of secret? He went, I don't know what the fuck it is. He said, they turn up, they plug in. <laughs> That's what they sound like, then they leave. He said, I don't even know what's going on. He said, all I know is if you want to sound like Conrad, he has a two by four, he hits himself in the head with while he's trying to make himself angry before he sings. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> that's classic. Oh, they are crazy. Yeah. That's what I'm crazy. But I think, I think that, I, that's it. That's it, Jay. I would just say to underline what Jeff was saying, I think if you put a, a, a good drummer on there, if you had a rock hunter playing on there, if you had a, a guitarist who was playing all arpeggiated everything, and you had a guy who had went in there with the intention to be a singer, who was a singer, it wouldn't be welcome to hell. It, it just happened. And that's the fucking magic in it. It just yeah. happened. And you didn't want mm -hmm. perfect. You wanted all that. The way you describe the whole cover, the way everybody's described how the music is, that's what you wanted. You wanted that. It looked like that. You wanted the sound to match what you were looking at. And that's what happened. Yeah. Hell yeah. Great, Perfect. Great. Well, uh, who do we have left here? I think we've been making her wait forever. Robin? Down in the corner, Robin. Robin! Can you unmute yourself down there? You can't unmute yourself? <laughs> I like do sign do language. <laughs> I'm hitting it for you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. You unmuted me. <laughs> there was something Hi. scratchy going on. I thought it was coming from her. I told her I could unmute you at any time. And she goes, No, I'll just leave it off for now. Bob, it's been <laughs> forever since you've been back on the channel. Welcome back. I miss you so. Thank you. I miss all you guys. And what a better way to come back with, you know, everybody here right now. I'm like, you know. So See you. It's so good to see you. It's good to see you guys. And it's, you know, always, you know, pleasure. And the stories are amazing besides, you know, all the yeah. music and everything. It's so good. So um, I joined late. So I'm kind of like, what's going on? But I kind of got the gist. You know, you guys are all talking about, you know, it wouldn't be Venom if this and the sound. It's like, yeah, the whole essence, per se, of the first record and Venom in general is just you know, so powerful and amazing, you know, for me personally, as well as probably everybody else on here, it's, 
you know, you put it on and we've talked about it before, like some of my favorite songs, like on that album, Welcome to Hell, of course, you know, Witching Hour. Oh my God. Like that song, as we said before, I love playing that song. So I totally understand. It's just, you know, I want to like kind of fight people when I'm playing it. And I like, I don't <laughs> know. I just want to like, ah, it you brings go. out every... Yeah, it just brings out everything. Um, you know, One Thousand Days in Sodom, in Leap with Satan. There's so many good songs on there. Yeah. That, oh my gosh, it's so influential. Like, like for me, and even now, I mean, playing any Venom songs, and I don't want to give it away. But my my new band, we actually did a cover of Venom, but I don't want to give it away yet okay it's on, the, it's on the new record coming out so maybe oh. i'll like because <laughs> that's just made my tribute to you know venom because it's just so good i just love everything about it you know the music all you guys like and you know getting to know you guys on these shows and it's just been so special and and you know i don't know i don't have really any questions because you know <laughs> I just want to say I just love you guys it's just amazing and I'm glad I could you know finally get online to be here with everybody that I've missed you know for so long you well, know it's a good thing that you were back doing what you're supposed to be doing instead of sitting on yeah. your couch talking to me on a Wednesday or Monday night <laughs> yeah. I mean it was yes it was great getting out on back on the road touring and everything but I still missed everybody well I hope that's back real How soon so yeah. How is it touring in the U.S.? Because, of course, we, we haven't been in for quite some time now. But how, how is it out there touring, Robin? Um, it was definitely, I mean, honestly, the tour that I was on, I can't really say too much. Like, we just kind of went about it. Like, nothing was going on. Okay. You know, and not the wood, nobody got sick. I think one person kind of got a cold and they tested. But other than that, we, just, we were out for two months. Yeah, yeah, it was a while. Was, uh, 47 shows. That's a big tour. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing yeah. you got it all in without any issues. That's amazing. Yeah, Great. but, uh, you know, again, I, you know, I guess it's just, you know, a lot of people are testing, period, you know, throughout the tour and, you know, you're going to, somebody's going to be sick or somebody's going to test positive. You know, oh, it's well. touring. You're all living together, close together and, and uh, you yeah, know, be, every day, every day, every day. And you're to be was, get uh, sick. Just so our viewers know, the tour that Robin was talking about was uh, the Black Label Society obituary. Who else was on that tour, Robin? Uh, um, Prom. 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 Okay. So it was a big tour going around the state. Yeah. It was good. And when you, think, when you think about it, even to be fair, and Jeff will back me up, and of course, all you guys who play and tour, it, if, if you do any to us, someone get sick at some point anyway. So it's, oh, yeah. it's just what sure. isn't it? Somebody yeah. is always going to get sick. It's inevitable. You can't, yeah. like, you know, everybody's breathing in each other's breaths, basically, <laughs> <laughs> on a daily basis. Socks. You know, all close that, encounters all every that day. Sock so. but all that boy socks smell on the bus. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know but i hope to see you guys out on the road i want to i want to see you guys play again so much like mm -hmm. I definitely well, it's like, like, we got we, the new album going this year and hopefully our shows we're lining them up and as long as we can get through the protocols and the red tip and it's safe everybody mm -hmm. will be you know um cool. can i I, I, I know we're going to close, Steve. And, and, Pretty and soon, Steve, yeah. I just got to give my three songs and then we'll get some closing statements. Yes, sure. You want okay, me to, well, get, I'll, you want me to three. give my three and then we'll kick yes, back you, to you. And we'll, I'm yeah, going to go out fast today. Yeah, I'm just, everybody's already talked about everything already tonight. Time to get to me. So I'm witching hour. I was listening to this album today for, you know, as we were getting ready to do this episode. I hadn't listened to it in a little bit. And, man. What a great album. And I just wondered how many how many bands were influenced by this fucking record, you know? By Welcome to Hell. And that's, of course, the influence of everything going back. And you put it on, 
40 years ago and it doesn't sound like dated it sounds amazing and it still sounds so strong and uh mm -hmm. i i was trying to listen to this, uh, in the league with satan it's always one of my favorite songs from this album i like the song poison a lot too so i wanted to mention that and uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on. I thought this is a very special episode of Rock Fantasy Files. And Tony always comes through with the great guests and uh, love to hear Tony chat about everything. And of course, Mantis, I see you on your Facebook show a lot too and uh, all that stuff. And how many cats do you have right now, Mantis? Uh, <laughs> right now, I've got 17. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Master <McCoy. laughs> He's my cat, baby. <laughs> now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the ball back to Tony and let Tony wrap this thing up. If anybody else has any closing statement, and uh, because I gotta hop along with Ryan and John, we're gonna jump over and see a Tranquility's channel and debate on whether Number the Beast is better than Screaming for Vengeance. So no, John, my hair. <laughs> <laughs> gotta figure out which one's gonna win at eight o'clock. But uh, oh, Screaming for Vengeance. Definitely. Mm. For vengeance. Yeah. We, got, we got the votes from Venom for Screaming for Vengeance. So I'll let them know when we hop over. Absolutely. I just I just wanted to say, obviously, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming and doing it. Because yeah. I know it's late and, and he's been working a lot. Uh, he was doing vocals today, so he's kind of tired and he had, you know, uh, not feeling so good. So thank you so much. Thank you, all you guys. It's so wonderful to see you all. I really want to see you in the flesh very soon when we're live. And you're all welcome as our guests to whatever show you want to come to. Don't buy tickets, awesome. just let me know. And you're our guest. But I just want to say, it, for me, if I sum up this album, it opens with the words, somewhere in time, we were born. And if you keep that meaning, that's Venom. They didn't come from any corporate thing. They didn't come from any rehearsed rich families who bought equipment. They didn't come with these high flying dreams. They just created something because they wanted to. And so those words are the essence of Venom. Somewhere in time, somewhere in time, we were born. And to see, to see Jeff being 60 now, to see Conrad still out there doing it, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and to see the album and Tony, and to see the album 40 years later, and, and you can put it on, and like you just said, Steve, you put it on, and it still feels as dark and as wonderful and as chaotic, mm. as aggressive, and as scary as it ever did, is quite remarkable. It's mm. quite remarkable. And for, so, thank young, you. and for like the younger viewers that are watching the show that aren't familiar, this is before personal pages, before all that stuff. They were the groundbreaking of this genre in my in my you know point of view. Any but, uh, for sure. But anyhow, I was like, gonna say something. I go forgot. Ahead. I wanted I wanted to thank them for not throwing those riffs in the garbage bin. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for not doing that because no, no problem. <laughs> well, well, back then there was there wasn't a delete button anyway, you know. So I just had to roll with whatever I had. <laughs> Thank goodness. I'm glad they they did not get deleted or thrown away. That's we, all I have. To say. We'd like to thank our guests from over the pond there for staying up so late. What time is it actually there in your neck of the woods, Tony and Jeff? I think it's, it's about, about nearly 12 30. Oh, okay. 12 30. Keeping you up late. <laughs> That's witching <laughs> hour. The, the witching <laughs> hour. Yeah. 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 The witching hour. Well, somebody <laughs> had to tell that, didn't they? What a, great way, what a great way to wrap up the show as we finish in the witching hour in their, in their homes. <laughs> Bless you. Thank all right, you so, so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Please take a moment Thank to talk to so the channel and do all that. Mention your favorite moments from Welcome to Hell in the comments. And uh, we'll be back with these guys in the future because 1982 makes another monumental black metals 40. So we have to come back later in the year. Cool, guys. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <Awesome>. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Take care.